Welcome back to Juice's Arthropods. My name is Juice, and today we have a real sexy video all about mold and fungus for you. So today I had this crazy idea, right? I was going to make this action-packed mold video. It was just going to be fireworks and explosions. And then I talked to mycologists and um, I realized that mold is not exciting. So I'm going to make it easy, digestible, and just try to make this fun. If you're a mold person, Egon, your life is weird. And I appreciate you, but unfortunately, I don't have the time. So first and foremost, I want to shout out two major people, which is Rubber Ducky's, uh, Rubber Ducky Isopods.com, as well as the Mantis Garden. Both of them gave me some good information. However, I'm not going to use any of it. I apologize, guys. But ultimately, it's just because um, if you guys want a longer mold video, hit me up afterwards and I can try that. But for right now, let's keep it basics, okay? So now I'm going to blow your freaking mind. Mildew, yeast, mold, and fungus are all the same thing. They're all just fungus, all right? We've established that. Great. So if I use any of those words going forward, they're just one of the same. Mold is just the morphological version of a fungus, okay? So when we talk about mold, we are talking about fungus. And this is in crucial because... 99.9% .9 of the mold you guys are seeing in your enclosures are just fungus. They're just cute little mushrooms just trying to make their way in the world. This is also a fungus. Kinshi, Hirotaki and uh, Harotaki, I don't know how to say that word. I'm sorry, guys. Is a form of fungus where you essentially take different types of mycelium, you add it into sawdust, and the symbiotic relationship is essentially it removes all the lignin and then you get this really cool stuff that you can feed to your beetles. This is a perfect example of a beneficial type of fungus. The kind of mushrooms you eat, a beneficial type of fungus. Most fungi are actually beneficial. In the wild, fungi actually will attach themselves to tree roots and they will transfer uh, the water that they have over to the trees and the trees in their response will give over to sugar. This relationship is crucial. It's also a form of symbi uh, symbiosis. Why this is all important. A lot of people panic when they see mold in their enclosures. And I, for one, love molds. And the reason for that is the following. You know what the most common types of arthropods sold in the hobby are? Tarantulas and isopods, as well as some millipedes. You know what two out of three of those really love? Soil. And you know what you need? A healthy soil. Beneficial bacteria in your soil. You just need a cocktail of delightful things in your soil so your little cutie isopods or millipedes can consume those things and they themselves can grow up big and strong. Do you know what fungus does? It adds in nutrients, guys. It's awesome. Anytime you've ever seen a mushroom, it's just the flower of mycelium. And don't get me wrong, mycelium is trying to take over the world slowly but surely. But we won't get into that conspiracy theory today because we're talking about the benefits of it, not the fact that it's secretly taking over the entire world. Anyhow, let's talk about how it's beneficial in your enclosure. If you see a little mushroom in there, it's not like your tarantula is going to munch down on the thing. It's going to add a lot of the nutrients that are pulled out of the soil. It's going to do its little spores thing. It's going to get all over the place and then it's going to spread. Now, 99.9% .9 of the spores that actually hit the ground, let's say hypothetically that the soil is healthy enough and wet enough that it was able to establish, it doesn't mean you're going to suddenly get overrun with mold. The only time mold is a problem in these enclosures is one major problem that is a problem I talk about all the time. When you have wild caught creatures, why do you think that is? I'll answer it for you. This thing was taken out of the wild. It's been stressed out from day one. It's been having to deal with birds, God, birds are bad enough just having them as pets. Can you imagine if you had to hide from those loud bastards all the time? They're trying to eat you. So it's fleeing from its life from birds. It's fleeing from all primates and everything else that it's doing. And then it gets shoved in a box and gets transferred to the United States or wherever you live. And then it's stressed out the entire time and it doesn't get enough water. And then you put it in the safety of a box. And for the first time, it's feeling warm and cozy and it feels loved. But it had a passenger with it, and that passenger could be things such as cordyceps or other types of fungus that are microsporidia or dimorphic funguses. I'm going to talk about those a little bit more, but I want you to remember those. So 
all tarantulas and all invertebrates have something called hemolymph. And within hemolymph is something called hemocytes. And within that, they have their own type of immune system. And I'm not an entomologist, so please call me out if you know the entire biology of them. But essentially, they have the ability to fight off parasites as well as the ability to fight off immune systems. But what they can't fight off is when they have a weakened immune system or they haven't been treated right or they're, say, put on um, coconut fiber as their sole you know, substrate and they just, they're just not doing well. You know what I mean? They're just not doing well. And it's the same way as you. You have the ability to fight off fungus as well. And then you get a cold. And maybe your body temperature drops a little bit. And maybe something else happens. And next thing you know, you have a fungal infection. Such thing as uh, just, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. So there are times when fungus can attack us. So most of the molds you're ever going to see in your enclosures are called saprophytic molds. What that means is it's, have you ever put like uh, any of the rapashi in there or any kind of food and then like a white cotton ball type little fluffy comes up to the top and everyone panics and like, oh my God, my isopods are going to die because it's going to trap them in there. And then you have other people that will lie to you and say like, oh, don't worry, buy more isopods. The isopods will eat the mold. And then the realists know that like the springtails are the ones doing all the taking care of the mold thing. So I'm mentioning this because that's saprophytic. It's when it's a type of mold. And what you're seeing is the mushrooms or the actual flower of the mycelium that's established there. If you see mold, that's awesome. You know why? Because it means your soil was good. Good soil makes mold. It's just because it allows it the ability to establish itself. It means you've got good humidity, good moisture, all of those things. And I know a lot of people, especially in the... Um, you know, the marijuana industry, they love mold. I don't know why. Go check out rubberduckiesisopods.com. He's the one that's going to be able to tell you all of those things. I, on the other hand, I'm going to stick to the bug part. We love mold because every time fungus is actually flowers and fruits, eventually it will fall down and it will die. And then all of the nutrients that it absorbed, it will put it right back in the soil. So it's just constantly transferring soil nutrients and your isopods need this. Your millipedes need this. So fungus is great. When I make my springtail cultures, you are guaranteed to see some fungus in there. Why? Because I want them to have the healthy fungus in there so that they can consume that. That's part of the macrobacteria that are in there. You need healthy soil for healthy bugs because that's how the world works. And when we are trapping all of these things inside, you know what ultimately happens? We sanitize too many things. And then these guys can get a minor cold and die, obviously. They're not cold, but whatever. Anyways, my point is you need these types of environments. When it's bad is when your tarantula or your little guy is wild caught. And this is the why behind that. In the wild, you have two things called microsporidia and it's called dimorphic fungi, okay, or fungus or fungi or however you want to pronounce it. Both of them are parasitic in nature. Now, they don't mean to be, but they do. Uh, but... They both have the ability to inertly get inside of your lungs. Now, as mammals, dimorphic fungus is worse. What it does is it takes the aerosolized conidia or spores and it actually shoves them in your lungs. And then it does this weird thing where it converts those spores into yeast. And yeast, while it can make delicious beverages such as beer and delicious foods such as bread, it also can cause infections in human beings, and you don't want lung infections. It's real bad, and oftentimes can lead to things such as pneumonia. Now, microsporidia does something very similar. It will actually sit within the host, and it will begin to fruit out. Remember how I mentioned that mushrooms are the budding fruit? Well, in things such as cordyceps, those fruits are going to erupt a bunch of spores that are going to rain down in your precious little guys in a horrible, horrible rain of hell. Seen The Last of Us? Something like that. Now, why do I mention this? Now, dimorphic fungus is primarily hosted within animals, not within arthropods. However, arthropods can sometimes have weakened immune systems because they're evolved to be able to handle all these problems in the wild. But then you get your guy wild caught. And what you've just done is you have created a Petri dish. You've given a live creature that's been in the wild with all kinds of horrible things such as, you know, uh, dimorphic fungi, microsporidia, 
all kinds of shit that you did not mean to bring into your house, but you've just brought it in the form of your new loved one and you brought it right on in into your controlled environment that has no ability to defend itself because it's never had to. So now once you've done that, sometimes people go, oh, it must have been the mold that was within my cage. Probably not. 99% of the time, it's not. It's the saprophytic uh, type of fungus that's in there. So when is mold bad? When A, the animal is wild caught, and B, when the reason for the mold is unchecked. The real concern with mold in an enclosure is not the mold itself. It's not the fungus. It's not the mushroom little guy that it plants in there. Because all of those things are normally fine. It's when your little invertebrate has a weakened immune system because of poor care, or B, when what you've done is you've created the perfect, perfect Petri dish for the fungus. If you have, let's say, any of the phonopelma and you have mold, what is that a sign of? It's a sign of you've made it too wet in there because what you imagined that enclosure needed to be, and it's obviously you didn't need to do this, you needed an arid enclosure and then you kept filling up its water dish and you forgot that water has to go somewhere. And then in a long enough timeline that water leaked down into the ground because maybe you did or maybe you didn't put any kind of barrier there. And now you've created a perfect environment for fungus to grow. And the problem isn't the fungus. The problem is that you made it a perfect environment for the fungus. And most invertebrates that aren't dealing with humidity, if they're an arid species, are going to die from that because you have created an environment that they are not able to establish. It would be essentially like if you put a bearded dragon in a paludarium and expected it not to have lung infections. That is the ultimate reason why mold is a bad sign. It's not because of the mold. It's because you've created the environment that's perfect for the mold. So in a normal scenario, mold is totally fine. If it's in your isopods cage and you see die-offs, it's not the mold killing them. It's the fact that you've created an environment that they were not able to survive in. I have kept hundreds of thousands of isopods. And in the beginning, I panicked every time I saw mold. I would completely rehouse everything. And then I just stopped dealing with it. And I just upped the amount of springtails I have in there. And as well as the other beneficial bacteria that you can add in there. And sure enough, it completely handled the problem. I didn't have to worry about this issue anymore. And the reason was... I've just now made it a perfect established uh, environment for it. So when should you worry about mold? Well, when you have an arid species, that's immediately obvious. The second one is when the mold is growing uncontrollably and beginning to take over the cage, you see a little mold here or there, you're going to be totally fine. Is it a Gramostola pulchra and you've got, you know, one quarter of the cage is beginning to mold? Then maybe just calm down on the water there. The reason you need to concern yourself with the humidity in all of these cages is because you also need to understand how all arthropods breathe. They either have spiracles or book lungs or some type of lung that essentially requires the oxygenation to flow over it, okay? And that's how it brings it in. It aerates it anaerobically. And the problem with a mold environment is that the humidity is increased and it could exceed what they're actually capable of filtering out. You need a little bit of humidity. I mean, even human beings need a little bit of humidity in their lungs. However, your species is going to depend on it as far as what is the, the actual relationship with heat or humidity they need. So if you follow the proper humidity guides and you still have a little bit of mold, don't panic. Just get more springtails. They'll take care of all of it. If it's a very wet environment, prepare for mold. It's fine. Unless you start seeing massive die-offs. In that case, increase humidity first, or worst case scenario, just leave the container without adding water for a little bit and the mold will just die out. It needs it to be wet for it to continue to grow. So you won't have any problems. But when is mold bad? In both scenarios where mold is bad, okay, we are talking again about dimorphic fungus and the microsporidia. It's gonna be abundantly clear. Your animal is gonna act real weird. And you know what? You're not going to see any of it. So that's the thing that really should concern you is the fact that if you're seeing mold, that's the good stuff. 
you see your tarantula, your spider, it starts tweaking out a little bit and it's, its legs and arms are kind of moving and they're real sporadic. And so you're thinking it's dyskinetic syndrome or DKS. Oftentimes it actually is mold. It's not the syndrome. It's you have a fungus infection that is creating this thing. It is growing out from the inside of it and it is creating trauma. So that is one thing that you can look into. Fortunately, there's no veterinarian assistance for this. So oftentimes the uh, it's going to be fatal. But keep that in mind. It was not given from the mold in your cage. It was established within it because it was wild caught. You're not going to really see that problem within the captive bred community. It's going to exclusively be from when it comes from within. This is why I do not bring anything into my house that's wild caught. If I can, uh, obviously there's going to be sometimes, but I keep them away from everything else. The other thing is I don't take things out of my backyard, not just because there's pesticides and everything else that could be on there, but because you could potentially bring in those mold spores. And the next one is things like the uh, things such as cordyceps. You're not going to know your animal has cordyceps. And for arachnids, it's most of the time not going to affect them until it does because it has a weakened immune system. So in short, guys, if your creature is healthy, your container is fine, you have a little bit of mold and it will look like a cotton ball or it's erupting in like a, a beautiful wavy tight mold, you're good. You don't have to worry about it. You know, I'm going to show a lot of B-roll uh, roll footage here. If it looks like any of this, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about it. Don't trust me 100% if you're from somewhere else besides California but you are going to be fine as far as that goes. It's not going to kill your precious little baby as long as it's being taken care of. But if you notice that your invertebrate starts to kind of spaz out a little bit, has the tremors a little bit, or it keeps trying to climb up the top of the surface and wants to hang by just its mouth, then you've got a bigger problem. I hope this helps. I hope it ultimately uh, makes you a little less afraid of that mold. Don't panic. Just get springtails. I will see you real soon, and I hope you enjoyed this video.